And thank you so much for having me. Um, this is very exciting for me because this is my second TFI conference. And I really enjoyed this particular technology conference because you actually have technologists that are speaking. There's a lot of technology conferences where you have people like me who are futurists, but who really don't have a, a, you know, embedded ground in technology. So it's very refreshing for me. You know, we love to speculate and pontificate about the IoT revolution and artificial intelligence and the blockchain, but really, we're kind of speculating. And you guys are the ones who can really actually give the quantitative um, approaches. And so I'm not here to um, talk about things I don't know about. I'm here to talk about the things that I do know about. And that is the future of the more, the social fabric that all of these wonderful new technologies are being adopted and seeping into. It's more specifically, on the market-oriented focus, and specifically with respect to the youngest generation. Like Kerry said, they're, they're fast coming up, and they're going to be a huge consumer group. And not only that, but we have, we have, very often we see that when it comes to uh, new technology, it's very often the youngest generation that picks it up first, and then it seeps upward. So that's why that's sort of my shtick. Well, I try to triangulate three different approaches. So my background is in social science, strategic foresight, and data analytics. So I, I use my strategic foresight component to kind of single out, to, 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 to get the weak signals and the emerging issues. And then I try to use different approaches, different methods of data analysis and statistics to, to test these hypotheses very early to see if we're really onto something. Uh, and all of this kind of I sift through a, a social science filter. So it's very different when you're dealing with technology because you can really base it on Newtonian physics, but it's not, it's a little bit messier when you deal with social issues. So I specifically look at these post-millennials, which uh, I have followed for the past, most of my career, 15 years. Uh, I have a couple of them at home, uh, so that gives me a constant inspiration to keep going. And uh, I remember specifically reading uh, a book with uh, my daughter a while back where there's a chapter uh, where there's a discussion between a living person and a zombie. And the zombie asks the living person, who knows more about life? And the living person thinks about it. You know, it's probably the living. But then she says, no, actually, you have been alive, and then you died, or you sort of died, because zombies don't really die. But you have something to compare it to. So having been alive and then not alive, you can actually say more about life than, than if you uh, were alive. So I'm actually here, when I look at younger generations, I'm a zombie. Because zombie is pretty much the definition. <laughs> if you're born after 1980, then, no, before 1980, then you're a zombie. So are there anybody here who are not zombies? Okay, good. <laughs> but you know what, actually being a zombie when you look at generational research is very useful. Because I'm sure some of you have read articles, oh, millennials are doing this, and post-millennials are doing that, and then if you're really honest with yourself, a lot of times you can say, I did that too. But it's just that we forget, you know, we kind of like, ooh, I've never been young. No, I never did that. But this, the, the distinction is really important because we have to separate what we call an age effect from a true generational effect. If you're looking at just young people and how young people behave, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a trend that is not likely to change very much. But if you're looking at a true generational trend, that's when you can really say, oh, okay, we need to re-strategize because these people are going in a different direction. So I'm trying to sift. It's like a sifting job. <laughs> I thought we're going to talk, to, uh, talk about post-millennials, but I was thinking of starting with the millennials because there's a lot of similarities. There are a few things, pivotal things that are different, but we need to have an understanding of how these guys are doing. So this is the last generation that was born in, in the past, uh, in the last uh, millennium. Obviously, that's why they call them millennials. You know how it was in the, 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 you know, in the 80s and the 90s? It was a pretty clear future. You had kind of a, a pretty good idea where we were going. You didn't have these sudden surprises that just came in from left field, these black swans that suddenly changed things. We, didn't, we, we, we had these exponential curves, but, but we didn't have the really, where it really started to take off. We were still kind of at an early phase, still, you know, where you had incremental uh, changes. So they they were catapulted into this new millennium and uh, in their early adult years realized that, ooh, the world has changed. Things are different. 
but they're still pretty optimistic. Uh, they're being fairly overprotected as children, uh, so <laughs> people call them precious snowflakes. Uh, this has resulted in an ongoing trend in reduced uh, risky behaviors among young people, and whether you talk about um, uh, ju juvenile crime or, or illicit drugs or sexual abuse or, or, or teenage pregnancy, all of these trends are pointing down. And that's something that the post-millennials are doing also. And they are less loyal and faithful to traditional institutions and they're less, they have less admiration for traditional expertise. Now this is important because what they're seeing, first of all, they have all this new information so they can very easily test and, and, and provide alternative use. To, to what the, the ivory tower is telling them. But it's also that these, these traditional kind of staunch, these, these, these slow-moving institutions have not caught up. They're always on, expect, you know, seamless user experiences. I don't think that's a surprise. And, they, they, and this is one of the reasons that lesser emphasis on traditional expertise make them more likely to trust other sources of, of information. So, Generation Z, they're kind of like millennials, but there's a difference. They are native to this new reality. They're native to the 21st century. Now that might be like, yeah, duh, but if you really think about it, that's huge. What was one of the first things that happens in the, in the 21st century? One of the first disruptions we had, 9-11. You have the recession, you have, uh, you know, pretty, you have crazy technology taking off. It, it's really a shift in the formative environment of growing up. It really means that some of these dimensions that they're growing up with, they don't take the things that we took for granted, they don't take that for granted. So for example, uh, one of the big sort of um, standards that, that we've, we've measured here in the States in a way, like the belief in the American dream, are you going to reach the American dream, you know, the one with the picket fence and the, the house and the car in the driveway, well, these guys, they don't take that for granted. They don't believe in the American dream, or they're redefining it. They're not saying, for one thing, they're saying, mm, I don't know about that picket fence. I don't know if that's what I want to do. And they know that they don't, just because you do this, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean anything. You, you still might end up with you know $100,000 in student loan and not being able to get a job or move out of your parents' apartment because, or parents' house, because that's what they're seeing their older siblings uh, re facing right now. They are what I call the true digital natives. And I know that, you know, these, these with word digital natives and digital nativity tends to be thrown around a lot. And I know that, uh, the, 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 I think the most agreed upon definition is whoever is savvy with digital technology. Well, heck, you know, I am a digital native. I'm Generation X. And back in the 80s, I had a Commodore 64. And I was pretty good with it. That's digital technology, guys. So. What I, what I think of as digital nat uh, nativity is that the technologies, the communication technologies that they're interfacing with are changing the social reality around them. That's, that's the whole definition, that before they even have a chance to say anything about it, agree, disagree, whatever, it really means that before they are born, while they're still in their mother's tummy, that sonogram is becoming an Instagram. So they have digital footprint before they're born. It really means that they can have a hundred more friends in social media or in through gaming or through, through in the in, in cyberspace, and maybe even feel closer to them than the people that they know in their their more uh, physical environment. And they take well, that's just reality. That's that's the definition. That's the that's the uh, founding experiences of their childhood. It, in many ways, this is the generation that is growing up with the same kind of um, issues that we're, when we look, we used to talk about child celebrities, that, you know, they, they were, there was always paparazzis around and they really didn't have control over their own publicity. Well, th these two. If we are talking about how this generation is changing communications uh, technologies, I think it's very useful for us to think of three different trends. And then I'm, I'm going to wrap that up in some conclusive thoughts. The first is the impact and limitations of their use of communications technology and what we're seeing there. Uh, secondly is data security and privacy. And then something that is on everybody's lips these days, which is fake news, the rise of fake news. So I'm gonna try to contextualize some of these issues and driving forces. Anybody who do not agree that this is the new normal? <laughs> yeah, 
they don't make this distinction, you know, it's not a binary, like you're offline or online, you know, when we went, sat down with our clunky computers and listening to that dial-up sound and you would sit there for 20 minutes and you would log off. No, that's, it's a seamless thing for them. I mean, you guys know that because you work in, in, in the industry, but it's really, I mean, sociologically as well, it's really changing their, their, who they are as people. And it's very easy to think then that, oh, they embrace everything digital and that's all they care about and we're gonna continue on this path and they have completely no critical thinking uh, with respect to uh, digital technology. That's not really true. What we're starting to see in surveys is that they are very aware of, for example, their own, uh, own addictiveness. <laughs> uh, they're aware of things like cyber, cyber bullying. They actually, in surveys, will say that they prefer face-to-face uh, -face interaction uh, when they don't get face-to-face -face interaction. That very often has to do with the fact that that person is not around. So, if the parents are not driving them to a play date, they will maybe do the next best, and then we'll take an iPad and have a FaceTime play date. Very natural, I mean, that's kind of what we do too in business. Um, but uh, one thing that we also tend to forget, this is a generation that is absolutely always on. So when we're sick of our colleagues, when we go at home for the day, and we're like, oh, you know, you can, Close the door, you can pour yourself a stiff drink and you can sit and watch a show or on Netflix or whatever, and we can, you can kind of forget about it. They can't. When they get home, there is a hundred text messages and there's a best friend or 15 best friends who are new profile pictures. And, and if you don't respond to that instantly, oh my gosh. I remember just to kind of give you guys a story. I took my kids to Norway last summer and there's a seven hour uh, time difference. So at 12 o'clock at night, Norway time, I was working while my kids were in bed. I saw the iPad on the table and it lit up, lit up, lit up. And after a while, I just had to look at it. So it was my daughter's iPad. Are you there? Hey, hello, hello, are you, hello, are you, are we not friends anymore? Boo hoo, emojis, ah, the world is falling apart. And it took less than 10 minutes to get all of those text messages. 10 minutes while my daughter is sleeping in her bed and her best friend thinks that she hates her. Whew, whew, that's, that's something, guys. Um, and I've talked to a lot of media researchers too and that's really very much what they're, when they talk to young people, that's, that's really the, uh, the, the message that we're getting. So we wanna know, do you like the friend or not like the friend? <laughs> I, I absolutely, she's a very, very sweet friend. But you know, this is the new normal. It's like, yeah. Anyway, so another thing that we grown up tend to think is that, um, well, you have social media and then you have, you know, just regular, you know, people you interact with. You remember these cast from high school. You remember every single person, not only high school, but home too. You have the BFF, you know, that's Snapchat. It's like, you can be goofy, you can be authentic, you can, send a message and, uh, and then you know, design when it's going to delete itself. And you really only, it's a one-to-one -one communication. It's not really, you know, it's not, what, it's not your public display. But then you have the opposite, which is the queen bees. And that's Instagram. This is, this is me, everybody. Like, oh, this is my perfect world. I'm the big queen here. And look, look at how many likes I have. Look at how many followers I have. This is the public display. This is the queen bee. This is the one that you, you, you meet in the, in the hallway at school, and if you're on her wrong side, she'll snub you. Actually, we're seeing the same behaviors in social media. What they'll do there, they will block you. That's the way of showing the social hierarchy. Blocking somebody shows everybody that you're on the out, I'm on the in. But then we have a place for the outsiders to go. They go to Tumblr. That's the emos, that's the black dress, that's the alternative crowd, you know, the listening, they're poetic, they listen to alternative music, uh, and, they, and you can find some really beautifully curated uh, Tumblr sites. Now, I will say, if your child is on Tumblr, you might want to just pay a little bit of attention because there are some sort of destructive, self-destructive communities that idealize suicide and cutting and pro-anorexia and pro-bulimia sites, so it's, it's, you know, but again, it's the same thing. Like when, you, when your child starts hanging out with, you know, the alternative crowd, it's like most of the time it's, it's pretty, it's, it's a good thing, but you just kind of want to keep an eye on it. Then you have the YouTubers, and that's sort of, they know where they're going. So they're using their social media to get their message through, and they're very ambitious. For them, it's all about 
you know, getting that message across and, uh, and, and using it as an entrepreneur and maybe getting some ad revenue on top of it. And then you have Vines, which is the class clown, you know, the ones that are doing little silly things. And then, I'm sorry, if your friend, uh, no, if your daughter or son or your children's friends are friending you on Facebook, it doesn't mean that you're hip or cool, that they think that. It's kind of like the family reunion. It's like, okay, I'm here, <laughs> but it's, no, they're not on Facebook. They don't care about Facebook. That's for the old people, you know? <laughs> so there's a little bit of how the new dynamic, is. and of course, in five years, or maybe even just one year, it might look very different. There might be other social media, but these roles are not going away. So I had the opportunity to lead a national survey this, this fall for a big nonprofit in the educational uh, sector. And so we asked a lot of young people, what do you think is going to be the most important skill in the future? And they said communication before STEM, before anything else. That was really, it was really remarkable. And if you combine that knowledge with their use of communications technology, there's, it's a pretty interesting picture. Um, because the, it turns out that the ones who are using communications technology the most are also the ones that feel that they're most, um, uh, that ha they have agency of their future. This is a very important issue these days where, uh, uh, when um, uh, college tuition is going through the roof, a lot of kids are starting to ask, well, will there really be a return on investment if 47% of all of the jobs we have today might be automated. Do we know which jobs? What if I paid $100,000 to get a degree that a machine is going to do? So this is important. It's important that they're looking at various avenues towards building their careers. And, and these guys feel that they have more agency, the ones who are using. If we're to talk about trend number two, anybody know this girl? Well, she looks like a Barbie doll, right? She's more than that. She still has humanly impossible waist me measurements, but she is a robot, and she can communicate. She's just one of many artificially intelligent toys. I know that we're moving towards an artificially intelligent world with a lot of machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication and connected appliances, so all of these things are coming into our homes. We have Alexa, we have all of these instruments uh, to help us in our homes. Now, the difference, though, I mean, if you might have a nest thermostat, but your five-year-old is not going to go up there and share her secrets and her, and her inner feelings with your thermostat. At least my kids never did that. I don't know. Uh, Alexa, we've already started to see some of the things that are happening with kids are interacting with Alexa, but still, it's just the thing that you have in the middle of the room. So it's not, it doesn't, it's not, the context is not for the child to, they might ask her fart jo jokes and things like that, but they're not going to, you know, have very trusted conversations in the way that they do have with their toys. Where does this data go? It goes up in a big cloud, in the data deposit repository. Now the parents can go in, and some parents might be smart enough to go in and delete that, but that is an opt-in kind of thing. This is data, I mean, once it's stored, who knows what's gonna happen to it, right? And it, I, I've heard so many futurists say, yeah, privacy is dead, nobody cares about privacy anymore. No, that's totally true. If you, if you ask this generation, which is presumed to grow up in this new era where privacy doesn't mean anything, you ask them, children will actually be twice as likely to, to be watchful of what their parents are sharing about them in social media. There's actually a lawsuit in, uh, in Switzerland where uh, a, a girl is suing her parents for sharing things on Facebook about her. So what we're really starting to sh see here is the contours of a completely new uh, consciousness around the issues of cybersecurity and privacy. Again, this is not a fully formed generation. They're still children. Their prefrontal cortex has not fully developed, and still we're starting to see that they have more concerns around this. Again, it's because they're growing up in it. They have the issues to kind of frame it. They're formed by these experiences. So as we go into the future, don't be surprised if this is a generation that's going to lead the chart uh, of, of, um, uh, of, of creating some new uh, guidelines and boundaries in these areas. Again, there's going to be tons of data that can be data mined and put together and, and maybe even abused. This may be something we should think about now that it looks like uh, some governments are going in more authoritarian direction, 
Uh, yesterday, I think the president said that uh, the use of uh, torture or, or interrogation techniques can be, um, can be justifiable to get intelligence. Now, there could be many avenues to get to have aggressive approaches to get intelligence from people. Most of you will remember the Apple versus FBI case last year. I mean, if we combine these two variables together, we should be concerned. We should be concerned about all that data. I'm sure you guys are already on it, but this generation is formed by it, and they don't have a say yet, and it's them. It's their lives. They are the ones that have been cataloged since birth. So we can speculate, you know, is invisible the new black? This is the reason also that we're getting things like uh, ephemer ephemeral social media like Snapchat because they quite frankly did not want to have all of that data. They didn't want to have that, their reputation shaped by all of that social media. They have a huge interest in privacy and we're completely going in different directions generationally here unless we really start paying attention to this. Uh, the third trend, uh, the fake news or alternative facts, as we heard a lot about. I think it's important to, to mention because it's, it's changing content. It's changing how uh, content is created and how opinion is being formed. Again, I think it's report, important to remember the, uh, the, 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 the traditional bastions of, of truth and the ivory towers, again, we're starting to not have so much trust in these anymore. What's filling the void? This is a lot of what's filling the void. So we're trying to look at what, how, in a generational perspective, what, what's different? What happened? How, how, did, how did all of this happen? One place to look is advertisement. It's a good indicator of how all of these things change it. This is the first one here is my childhood where, you know, we were running around outside, getting scraped up, coming home, you know, in the evening. Uh, nobody really asked where we were, and we were certainly not on the screens. We were just, you know, just kids, and nobody really watched us or cared too much. Then something happened in the 80s, two big trends. The FCC started uh, deregulating a lot of the, the laws against um, advertisement toward children, and parents started to become more, uh, they started prisoning the children more. You know, the kids are not allowed to run outside because they could be kidnapped. So literally, you had a captive audience very early. So that shifted. So these kids have seen a lot more advertisement than, than our older generation. Now, you would think that that means that, oh, they're, you know, they're typically very informed by ads. Well, I think we've reached a uh, saturation point where it simply doesn't work that well. It's something about, you know, if you, if you pour something on, you know, if you pour a glass all the way up, it's just going to spill over. So these kids are not very, um, millennials and younger generations are not very easy to reach with traditional ads. So what does the marketing industry do? Well, they look at alternative ways. They, they go in the back doors, you know. So they, they, they put in native ads and content ads, and they kind of, just integrate the advertisement content into what looks like it's editorial content. So the boundaries are getting blurred. And that is very difficult for a lot of people to see the difference. So the Stanford recently did a, a study where they found out that 80% of millennials were not able to distinguish uh, uh, a native ad from, from uh, or, or sponsored content in what looked like it was an editorial article. So it's easy to blame this on the younger generation. I think there's another story to be told, and I, I really don't want to be political. That's not my point, but it's very important when you do social science research, you have to look at all the variables. And, you know, we know, we know that there were more anti-Hillary and more um, uh, pro-Trump content on Facebook and a lot of places. And since we also know that the ones who supported that uh, skewed older, we know that this is not necessarily only a generational trend. So again, I, it, I think it's important. I think it's too early to say exactly what's going to come out of this. Uh, perhaps the younger generation is going to be more trained. What I do think that they're going to, we're going to get new reliability standards. We're not going to go back to the ivory towers. We're not going to go back to long peer reviews and things like that to, to, to validate what's true and what's not true. Because it's simply, it's too much content and it's, it, things are, 
changing too fast. This is the place for artificial intelligence, I think. I think the NLP is going to go make bounds and leaps. And I think that the social networks are already starting to find ways uh, to find algorithms that can give sort of, sort of a probability score on truthfulness of various content. I, I definitely see that this generation is going to address privacy and cybersecurity issues much more. And we're not even close to, 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 to having uh, uh, the security we need to, for, for everything, to meet this future, I think. Uh, I worry about new class divisions that are based on digital technology and based on the use of digital technology. What do we use it for? Do we use it for learning? Do we use it for entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial activities? Um, and I worry about these silos, but uh, I, I also think that if there's a concerted effort to break out of these silos, I think we can possibly, like the upbeat, you know, the book we have, uh, Byron Reese's talk, I really think that we can, but I think it's gonna take some effort to have more cross-cultural communication and really use the internet for what it was meant for, which is enlightenment, not to create these silos. So, but the future is, I mean, it's up for discussion. That's the thing about futurists. We can't really predict. It's more like these, these are the different dimensions. This is where we see it going. So, any question, any rebuttals? You don't have to agree with me, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Since, uh, Twitter was left off of the social media apps, where does that? Uh... Um, I, I, yeah, I couldn't put everything in there. To me, and, and you know, what it seems to me in my research, and I, I don't have full data to say this, Twitter and LinkedIn, well, especially LinkedIn, but Twitter too, it's like, eh, for these young kids. I think also they use Twitter, but it's more like a soup. It's not, it doesn't have an identity. It doesn't have like a, oh, you use Instagram for this, or you use, uh, I mean, for the, on the, for the younger generation. So I was just kind of putting up the, 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 the apps that have something to say in the younger generation's world. But I, I could be wrong. I mean, it, I might have, should have put up Twitter there. Yeah. A question. Yeah. Is there anything that adults are doing that they're not doing to help kids cope with some of this? I mean, like a stranger danger type slogan that <laughs> would help them understand, the ones that don't understand already, that there's fake news and you can't believe everything you see on, on the internet? That, and that's why I wish I could have said it. And if I, if I really knew of some particular effort, I would definitely, I would like to, to include it here. Yeah. I think Europe has come a little bit further in that. I think there's a little bit more, uh, at least, you know, Europe is a little bit um, less, you know, here's the, the First Amendment is so strong. In Europe, it's a little bit more, okay, let's, let's really, you know, look through the content and, and also this right to be forgotten which is maybe the opposite issue. Um, I don't know of any effort right now. And so that's where I think the void is. And because there's a void, I think there's going to be an attempt to fill it. Um, I think it's just right now, it's just on the parents and the teachers and the educational institutions to try to teach kids to, um, to, to separate the two, yeah. I just have a comment. I mean, uh, when you talk about this new generation, I mean, as they're babies, I mean, you look around and parents are giving like one-year-olds cell phones to watch all the time. So mm -hmm. it's like they they have that from the very beginning. Yeah. And and back to the fake news thing, I don't know how you can train that at all. Yeah. Well, it seems to me like you kind of said the fake that older people are having a harder time discerning what fake news is mm -hmm. than younger people. It seems like it. Um, I mean, again, this is anecdotal evidence because I think that the problem with the Stanford study was that, and this is what I see a lot in generational research, you, you want to say something about a specific generation and you only, you only ask people in that generation, but when you do that, you don't have anything to compare it to. So that's why I wanted to put in this other picture too that indicates that this is not only a young problem, this is a, this is a problem. And very often when it comes to, for example, things like uh, a lot of these behaviors that people our age are, are expressing in social media, for example, the younger people was, ah, don't do that. You know, don't, don't write this long, pour your heart out on Facebook about everything you think about everything because they are already growing up with this awareness that, well, what you write here is a public record. And so they have this, this uh, almost instinctive 
um, yeah, they're growing up with it. So again, you know, they, they were probably less receptive to all of these traditional advertisement, even though they are the ones that have been subjected to it the most. So I think maybe, I, we can only hope that, that it's, it's sort of like a desensitizing process going on. Yeah.